My name is Jonathan Simons, I'm the Head of Education at Policy Exchange uh, and it's a huge honour and a privilege for me to welcome you here tonight to King Solomon Academy for the inaugural Policy Exchange Education Lecture given by Doug and Mob. Uh, it's a real pleasure and a privilege for us to have Doug to give this inaugural lecture. Uh, we were very lucky that I think literally five minutes after he announced he was coming to England, uh, I sent him an email on the off chance that he'd be free. Uh, and even more surprisingly, he said he'd be honoured to accept. Clearly, he shows he doesn't know enough about policy exchange. Um, but it's a real, it's a real pleasure and a privilege. Uh, we've had Doug with us here all day today, and it's been a real, um, it's been a real privilege again to hear from him. We've taken D and D, he's gone to teach first. He's met with lots of people, and he's understanding a little bit now about the UK education system. Uh, which is a huge benefit. Uh, the way tonight's going to work is Doug's going to give his lecture, he's going to speak for about 40 45 minutes, then there'll be a brief period of QA afterwards, uh, and you'll have the chance to ask him things you want to do. Uh, so now it would be a great pleasure to just ask our sponsor for tonight, Teach First, uh, and then she can take Red, 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 Red Wiggle to come up and say a few words. Well, this is just a really exciting event. This is the um, you know, center of a number of different Venn diagrams. I was laughing earlier today, I spent some time in our uh, office, and some of my staff were like little children, like schoolgirls, I thought, with One Direction coming into the office. I saw Sam, I've never seen you quite so happy as this morning, when you knew Doug was entering the building soon. Um, and to see how exciting all of them were to get a bit of the wisdom. Um, I want to start by thanking Policy Exchange and Jonathan and his team, who have all been fantastic supporters and partners of Teach First for a really long time. Um, all of us are working together to close the achievement gap, and it's, it's been a really great partnership for that. Um, and of course, there's no better way to talk about that than where we are today at King Solomon Academy, um, which has obviously just had amazing results, which many of you are aware of. It, it brought me back to when we started Teach First 12 years ago. And I, I want people to get their minds back. It was a long time ago. I, I remember um, I was on a McKinsey team that was looking at how businesses could help education in London because results were so poor in London. And at that point, I remember saying to the data team, find me a really outstanding school in London that has a majority of kids with low-income communities. And they looked at it, and they came back there to learn and said, we, we can't find any. It doesn't exist. Um, there were no really outstanding schools in London that they could find that had a majority of kids from low-income communities 12 years ago. I remember meeting head teachers, you know, head teachers in London of schools that we now work with that are now outstanding <coughs> schools, actually, saying things like, um, you know, the best we can do for these kids is to keep them out of jail and off the street. That would be success. Um, one very senior policy person telling me, look, when you get these really great kids from low-income communities, what you need to do is try to get them into a grammar school or a private school where they're really brought, and, and that's the best way to do it. And the belief that you can have comprehensive schools with a lot of kids from low-income communities succeeding at a high level, I think was just broadly seen as a bit of a pipe dream, not something that was possible. I think the most exciting, one of the most exciting things, ways Britain has changed over the last 12 years, the way the policy debates changed, the way you know, people's views have changed over the last 12 years, has been in education, where you just do not hear people say things like that anymore. You know, those, those sort of comments I've not heard in the last few years. London has gone from the lowest performing to the highest performing region in the country. There is a lot of now outstanding schools, and outstanding practice, being peppered across the capital, with some of the schools achieving really high results and doing really well with obviously children from all backgrounds. However, the results are in King Solomon County have even trumped all of those, which I think is so amazing because again, it's shown again what's possible. And obviously, you know, that 93% of their students achieve five good GCSEs, including English and maths. I've been to a number of outstanding schools across the capital which have gotten a good, you know, 80% at that level, have gotten good results, and they rightly feel really good about it. The fact that um, KSA has now managed to jump over that bar and get over 90%, I think is now showing them what's possible. And it's again showing that the bar is constantly being risen for children from learning communities, which is just such an exciting development for all of us, for all of the work that we're all doing, for all the children that we're all working with. I think one of the most exciting um, stats that I saw here was you know, 12 years ago when people were saying, you know, if you get a really good kid from a low-income community and he's really smart, try to send him to private schools where he can thrive, and that's the best way forward. And of course, now what it says, if you get a really smart kid in a private school, try to send him to King Solomon Academy, because that's where he'll thrive, because it's a much better school. And of course, um, just pick out one, rugby, a very good independent school, got 64% of their kids on the EVAC this year, which is really good, of course. It's not as good as King Solomon Academy, which got 75%. Um, and I think you're seeing that all over the country, actually, that the best teaching, the best practices, um, some of the most you know, outstanding results are happening in schools 
comprehensive schools with large and low income communities. And we're starting to reach that point, which is just where we always want to get to. The kids that need the best teaching are beginning to get the best teaching, and that's, that's really where we need to get to. And we're going to hear more about that tonight, which is why I'm going to shut up to let the speaker who's going to talk about that actually speak. Uh, Doug Lamal is the acclaimed author of Teach Like a Champion. Anyone who watched uh, Tough Young Teachers last year, let's actually see Oliver back there, is one of our Tough Young Teachers, put, uh, put the book right in the satchel for that first day of school, using it as a Bible, which many of our teachers do. Uh, it's a best-selling book that sends out clear, practical ways in which teachers can manage their classrooms and put their children, from whatever background, on a path to college and or university and wider success. The book's been widely acclaimed, and I, I think it's near compulsory readers, uh, readers reading for Teach First. Doug's the managing director of Uncommon Schools, a group of charter schools across New York, New Jersey, and Boston, with a mission that all of us share to close the achievement gap and prepare to deprive students to go and graduate from the best universities. His schools have a tremendous track record, not only in closing the achievement gap, but also outperforming the state average performance in maths and English. His approach continues to be very popular among educational reformers in the UK, who believe that high quality schools can play a transformative role in raising standards and improving social mobility. So I think there's no better way to start a school term in a, in a school like King Solomon Academy, and there's no one better to spend it with than someone like Doug Lamont. So let me introduce Doug, please. Thanks, Brett, and uh, thanks to all of you. I'm really honored and excited to be here. And thank you for Teach First and for Policy Exchange for giving me the opportunity to speak with all of you tonight and to share uh, some of the things I've learned studying and thinking about superheroes. Uh, in this case, superheroes who are great teachers. Uh, that is the title for my, uh, my talk tonight, is Where Are All the Superheroes? And the short answer to that is probably right here at King Solomon Academy, uh, as, as you know from the results. Uh, but I do want to talk a little bit about the role of teachers in teaching in uh, one, building great schools at King Solomon Academy, and two, it's scaling that across a nation that richly uh, deserves and needs so many teachers. And if you don't mind, I want to start with a story. It's a story of heroism and adversity. Uh, uh, it's not a bedtime story, though, so please don't fall asleep. Uh, it's a story in which uh, this woman, almost completely anonymous, plays the starring role as a hero, protagonist. Her name is Zenaida Tan, and of course you've never heard of her. Uh, and she lives in a place where so many heroes and villains and princesses live, uh, which is to say Los Angeles. She's a teacher there. Uh, and the reason I'm talking about her tonight is because a couple of years ago, four or five years ago, the Los Angeles Times managed to get its hands on value and data on every teacher in Los Angeles Unified School District. So they took their annual test results in the, in the US and most states now we test every year in reading and math. And uh, apparently the district had had this data for years. And they knew inside the district who the best teachers were and who they were. But they'd never done anything with it for a variety of reasons. Uh, and so the LA Times got wind of this and they, uh, they did a Freedom of Information Act request, which, mean, which meant that the district had to share the information. And the LA Times well, they did some crazy things, but they, they printed a list in the paper of every teacher in Los Angeles ranked top to bottom uh, in terms of their outcomes. So, uh, you, think you, you think league tables uh, are, are a popular over here. But it was interesting because what they found was that there, were set, there, were, there was a very small set of positive outlier teachers, teachers with incredible results. Uh, in their classroom, students of need uh, raised their achievement, increased their rate of achievement, by twice what they did in an average teacher's classroom. Not twice what they did in like the least confident teacher's classroom, twice what they did in a good teacher's classroom. And this woman, Zenaida Tan, was not only at the top of the list, she'd been at the top of that list for something like, you know, for, for years, something like 10 years. And so the author of this story, Jason Felch, who's, a, who's then a journalist for the LA Times, said, well, I'm going to go out and I'm going to interview her. I'm going to talk to her and see what I find out. This is what he found out. This is, I'm quoting here from his story in the LA Times. LA Unified School District has hundreds of Jaime Escalantes, teachers who preside over remarkable successes year after year. Jaime Escalante, if you don't know, is, uh, he's a great math teacher in LA who had a movie made about him and how he inspired students. They achieve remarkable successes year after year, often against incredible odds, but nobody's making a film about them. Most are like the Night of Pam, working in obscurity. 
No one asks them their secrets. Most of the time, no one even says good job. Often, even their own colleagues and principals don't know who they are. TAM brings effective ways to reach limited English students, handle discipline problems, and keep the kids engaged. I do a lot of singing, games, she said. It doesn't look like a lesson, but no one asks for her advice. She says her fellow teachers at Morningside consider her strict, even mean. She tends to keep to herself. Nobody tells me that I'm a strong teacher, she says. That's okay by her, she adds. Year after year, she watches her students make enormous progress and feels a five sense of By LAUSD's measure, TAM meets standard performance, as virtually all district teachers do. Evaluators only other option is below standard performance, which by the way, 2% of teachers receive. <laughs> On a recent evaluation, her principal checked off all of the appropriate boxes, TAM said, then noted that she had been late to pick up her students from recess three times. I threw it away because I got upset, TAM said, why don't you focus on my teaching? Fascinating story to see this incredibly high performing teacher uh, and see the world of teaching in a system and in a school through her eyes. So, what's the moral of this, of this story? Well, uh, there are a couple. One is, is that uh, we see teachers, but we don't really see them. They're often unseen. We don't know who they are. We don't know what makes them tick. Often the very best among them. Uh, we can see their big outline, but we don't really know. Uh, we don't know what we don't know the details of their daily lives. It's actually, our best teachers. It's also kind of a bit of a system failure here, which is if you think about the evaluation which uh, LA Unified School District gave to the night attack, this is the system by, by which they engage in what you would call performance management. This is how we make people better. This is how we honor our good people and invest in them and teach them how to and show them how to improve so they grow throughout their lives in education. Of course not only unsuccessful at doing that, um, potentially pushed, drove, contributed to potentially driving her out of the profession. Which is also interesting when you think of what the failure rate in, in schools like Morningside are, is, is in schools like Morningside. In the United States, 50% of teachers in high need urban districts leave the profession in three years. So what that tells us, and this is maybe the most important part of the story, is that right down the hallway from Zenaida Town were five, six, seven teachers who failed out of the profession, who really wanted to become teachers, who decided that this would be their life's work, and they were so unsuccessful that they left. When the solutions to their positive problems, to their challenges, were potentially right down the hallway, they just didn't know if she was there. So, uh, so this would be the four of my remarks for today. There are some other, there are some other takeaways from this. Uh, you're probably fascinated with the uh, obsessive league tableness of the US. Uh, I'm very much in favor, I should say, of league tables about schools and their results. But one of the things we do in the US is we do league tables on teachers, which I think is really strange. In New York State, now they've started putting in the newspaper rankings of teachers from your city top to bottom, which to me suggests a lot of things about what we think about the profession. First of all, that but foremost, that it's unmanageable that we can't give this data to the managers of the teachers and have them use it and make sound decisions about these teachers, how to make them better, who should stay, who should go, and that instead we have to bypass the managers and give them directly to the public. And what other profession do we think that? Can you imagine uh, if the mortality rates of doctors were published in the papers, top to bottom, uh, you know, an eminent uh, cancer doctor who took on the hardest cases and, uh, and his reward would be to have people know, you know we just wouldn't do that. We'd let a hospital manage it. We would trust the hospital. So I think that's fascinating. But there's also a degree to which teachers are culpable in participating in a model in a model that prevents their being differentiated and identified for their success and studied for their success. I think as a, as a profession, we're inclined to buy into this industrial model that assumes that all of us do the teaching is the hardest job in the world, you could argue. And we assume that all of us do it about the same. We all, what we really need from our organizations is not investment to make us better, is not insight, is not identification of what we do best, it's protection so that none of us can be fired or none of us can be uh, noted for, uh, for lack of success. And so we protect ourselves from this kind of, from the kind of identification and study that uh, would have allowed us to benefit from Zenaida Tense Insight. And so great teachers, 
in great teaching are at the core of great schools, but they're often misunderstood, and we fail to recognize the power that they uh, that they could give us uh, when it's often right under our nose or right down the uh, perhaps when the lamp hallway. I don't understand. But I'm not really telling you anything that you don't know when I say that. When I say that great teaching is an incredibly valuable resource uh, that we should all prize above almost any other, because you act on this every day. I was walking to the was the ark the other day down. I think I was um, I think it was in Holborn. <laughs> Thought I knew where it was. I walked by uh, I saw a mom coming down the street. Uh, she was walking her son to school. Uh, she had the hijab on. Uh, obviously, she's uh, Muslim. She's holding the hand of her son. She's wearing a sweater at the school, and it's a Catholic school. So this is a mom. She's a mom of faith, obviously. Her faith, interestingly, is in, is in I'm willing to I'm willing to make to uh, I'm willing to give up religious education in order to get my students the very best teaching that they can find. And parents make sacrifices like this all the time, choosing choosing the best possible teaching as teachers for their children. In fact, uh, pretty much everybody knows that this is true, whether they want to acknowledge it or not. This is data uh, from the city of St. Louis in the United States. These are two contingent towns. This is Sunset Hills in the red at the top, and this is uh, Riverview in the, in the red at the bottom. And their graph, according to the price per square foot of a rental apartment or a, a, a real estate in the towns, it's four times as high in Sunset Hills as it is in Riverview. Why? Because the school system is better uh, in Sunset Hills. And so the people who can afford it live in Sunset Hills, and the people who can't live in Riverview. Uh, and as, uh, so uh, that's one thing that we have in common, both here and in our country, which is people who can afford it select teachers. You don't have to explain to them the power of a great teacher. Uh, and everyone does it, whether they acknowledge they have school choice or not. I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say that teaching is the most important, uh, arguably the most important job in the economy. This is why people value it so much. In addition to the hopes and dreams of individual children, which is a very powerful thing when you're a mom and you, uh, you have to choose the right school for your child, uh, Eric Hanischek, a economist in the US, studied uh, Western Hemisphere nations for 40 years and correlated their rate of GDP growth to the quality of educational outcomes in their schools. Interestingly, he also uh, correlated it to the amount of seat time that kids spent in their schools. And what he found was that the amount of time, the amount of minutes kids spent in schools in different countries had no correlation to their GDP growth over four years. But the quality of their education outcomes, as measured by test scores, explained 80% of GDP growth over four years. So in addition to uh, the hopes and dreams of individual students, you teachers in the room, thank you, because uh, you're also responsible for the economy. So uh, good work and keep it up. So arguably, this is the most important uh, work that we do in our society. Uh, and it's fascinating work, and just because, uh, and it's incredibly challenging work. And it's, it's full of challenges. You can say problems, I'll try and frame it a little bit more positively and say it's full of, uh, of challenges. Some of them are what you would call exotic challenges. Things that you could never predict would happen. I have a picture of a bird up here because I have a colleague who's a teacher. She arrived for her first day of school to find that birds had nested in the corner of her classroom, and she couldn't get a custodian to come up and take care of it, and so her first week of classes was continually interrupted by the squawking of pigeons trying to get out of the uh, banging themselves into the window of the classroom. Uh, when you train to become a teacher, there's no real reason why you should be prepared to handle this kind of problem, this exotic problem. Uh, right. uh, but there are also endemic problems. <clears throat> and endemic problems are the opposite of exotic problems. They are totally predictable problems. And there are all kinds of endemic problems in teaching. One of them is your first day of teaching, you walk into a classroom, you, go, you decide you're going to teach in the communities of the greatest need, and you say, well, welcome kids, nice to meet you, I'm Ms. Herlamov, would you all sit down so we can get started? And the kid turns to you and says, you sit down. I think the last time that happened to you in your job, right? But, but this happens. Kids are disrespectful, we know that this is going to happen, so we, have to, we, we should know how to handle this kind of situation. Or you walk into your classroom and there's a kid who's not disrespectful to you in any way. He just wants to hide in the corner and he puts his hoodie up and he won't cause any disruption at all unless you try to push him to learn because he will push back on you so you leave him alone and let him drown. Or there's, uh, or there's a kid who, uh, who can read and do code perfectly but can't seem to comprehend the text that he reads. He can read it out loud to you. It's, it's beautiful. It sounds, like, uh, it sounds like he works for the BBC. But when you ask some questions about it, you've got nothing out of it. These are totally endemic problems. We know they're going to exist. 
Uh, but the fascinating thing about our profession is that we have almost no institutional knowledge about ha how to handle these institutions, these endemic problems when they happen. And for the most part, you could spend, uh, you know, so some people fail out of the profession because they can't solve them, or some people spend 20 years solving them, and at the end of their 20, you know, at the end of 20 years in the classroom, they can have solutions to these, uh, to these problems. But really what we need to have is a systematic way of addressing these problems so that, uh, because we know they're going to exist, exist when we send good people into classrooms, they ought to have some idea what to do about these things. But uh, as of now, good teaching is too likely to be an accident. It happens for reasons we don't understand. At times, we can't predict. We need to make it predictive ones. As Brett mentioned, I work for a common an organization in, uh, in the States, and we run 40-something really great school uh, say this because I don't actually run the schools. <laughs> there are 40 really great schools that change outcomes for kids a little bit like kids all about that. We started out with this goal of, uh, of getting kids who were in communities where 5% of kids graduated from high school and getting them not only to college, but to be able to compete in the university and succeed there. And what we realized is we had to be a little bit better at every little interaction hundreds of times a day. If we weren't better at all the little things, uh, we weren't going to be able such a such a And we know that because basically our teachers said it to them. We hired really great, energetic, smart people. We described this beautiful vision of a school like this one, and we said, this is what we're imagining. Do you want to build it? Said, yes, great, go do it. And, the classroom. and they said, you know what? What you gave us when you went into the classroom, it was good. But if we're really going to achieve this, this, this goal that you set for us, of great schools like KSA all through the, the US, we have to be not just good, and we're not great. So here are our problems, solve them for us. When I walked into the classroom, I told the kids to sit down, and some kid told me to sit down. When I walked into the classroom, there was a kid with a hoodie who didn't want to learn. When I walked into the classroom, uh, there was a kid who seemed like he could read, but he didn't comprehend any of it. Solve our problems for us. Uh, and as the leaders of those schools, we found out that we were totally unable to answer those problems. And we were not doing our job to help people who had committed to this role with us. And so then we said, well, let's go look at what we learned in ed school uh, and in our teacher training. What we found was that they had lots of highly theoretical guidance for us, like teach kids not content, or, um, or they would advise us to read Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. It's a beautiful, inspirational book that had kids who no clue as to what to do when a student doesn't know how to read. And then we started thinking, well, you know, I actually read an article that said breakthroughs that pointed out that breakthroughs and innovation have historically been preceded by breakthroughs in measure. And so we decided to do some measuring, and we built a bunch of data sets that looked like this. This is a picture of New York State. You're used to seeing other pictures of New York State, so you might not recognize that first. <laughs> but there it is in all its beauty. Every orange dot on this graph is a school system in New York State. Uh, and it's the graph, uh, according to two factors. On the x-axis is the percentage of kids who live in poverty in that school district. Uh, it would be measured by eligibility for free meals. And on the y-axis is the percentage of kids who pass the state test. In this case, it's the year, it's the year seven for us, sixth grade, uh, New York State math test. And so what you can see here is as poverty increases, uh, educational outcomes slope down steeply. So if you don't have the uh, if you don't have the foresight to be born to privilege, your educational outcomes in New York State uh, punish you for that, uh, and that's your mistake, and you'll just have to live with it. Uh, and you can spend a lot. Of, we're all in this room, I assume, because we find this the slope of this curve immoral, the inverse correlation between uh, your postal code and um, destiny. So we spent a lot of time wringing our hands about this. But then someone pointed out, you know, look up in the upper right hand corner. Look at that school right there. Look at that classroom up there where there's the same amount of poverty there, even you know, some of the highest, the highest poverty in New York State. What are they doing? What are all these schools doing in the upper right hand corner? When you think about it, there are people throughout New York State who, despite all the challenges, we could spend hours outlining the challenges of poverty and how difficult it makes it to be successful in schools. But despite all those things, and so we have to do that makes it really, really good. It's fascinating to think. We have no idea who those people are. If this were any other industry in the United States, in the United States or in England, if this, was, if this was a graph of how much memory you could get on a chip per millimeter of surface area on the chip, and there were people in the upper right hand corner like that, we would all be sneaking into their chip plants, engaging in industrial espionage to figure out what they did so we could join in the fun. But in education, we don't have a culture of doing that. And so, can I tell that, that 
if, you, if this graph existed for London, some of the people who would be in the upper right hand corner would be in this room right now. And we have no idea who they are and how to study it. And so, uh, I have this idea, but I'm going to go see how many I can find. I can't find all of them. I'll find 10 of them. I'll find 20 of them. I'll go watch them. And so I went to watch these upper right hand corner teachers. And what I found was that they were incredible entrepreneurs. We don't think of teachers as entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs are people who come up with creative solutions to existing problems. And I mean, they were like they were brilliant entrepreneurs. The things that they came up with to solve these endemic problems. And my first thought after I walked out of the first classroom was, my God, I need a video camera with me. Because no one will believe this. In part because what the teachers did in these classrooms was so incredible. But in part because oftentimes it's exactly the opposite of what they tell you you're supposed to do in teacher training. Right? They were just there. They had, Jamie Burley, bless his heart, he had clearly not read the manual. I'm, you know, I'm, whether you can only talk with their hands raised or not. So uh, teachers were incredible entrepreneurs, and so we set out to, to and they had solutions to these endemic problems. And we realized if we're going to be, if we're going to be great, this is our opportunity to start kind of studying around those solutions and those teachers. And so um, actually, up in the upper right-hand corner, this is actually data from 2011, which is a little bit after we started this project. And the reason it, it looks like the data that we originally started with. But I want to uh, point this out because I want to show you video from this school right here, which is uh, which is Troy Prep. It's in upstate New York. It's in a tiny city with 40,000 people that's economically unviable. Uh, and if you, uh, if you have economic skills and you live in Troy, you've already got it. Uh, and yet, there are results. So uh, here are some videos uh, from the upper right hand corner of the graph. I'm going to show you. Uh, Two, maybe three classrooms, and then uh, how many people remember teachers? Great, so uh, I'll, I'll just show you know, a minute to chat from Mr. Chuck. You probably talk about them. I hope and I'll just tell you a couple things that I observe about them. If this were a typical workshop, I'd just stand up in the room and discuss it. Um, but I'm going to give you tonight off. So, uh, Natasha, if you would, this is Katie Bellucci, uh, and I'm just, just before you hit play, Natasha. Uh, so she's the six, she's the uh, sixth grade math teacher in Troy Prep. Natasha, I may ask you to pause a couple times. All right, here we go. Pencils down in three. Most of us have an answer. Two. One. Rock, paper, scissors, your answer on two, one, two. Hold them up high. We have some different answers out here. I see two, threes, and fours. So this is really interesting. One of the characteristics of great teachers is they're obsessed with data. They can't wait to the end of the lesson to find out if they master things. Right, so uh, she's asking them to look objective data. She's gathering it, but she's acting on it right away. Uh, uh, so there's a, one technique in Teach Like a Champion called Check for Understanding. In the new version of Teach Like a Champion, it's two chapters, uh, and it's the first two chapters of the book because I've realized that it's the core skill of great teachers. So here's Katie Check for Understanding. <clears throat> First of all, let's go back to this original equation. One half times the quantity x plus two equals twenty. Based on the answer choices, are we going to distribute or are we going to divide by one half? I like this hand track Sherwin. Who agrees, Sherwin? Yeah, we are going to divide by one half. I saw a lot of you do that. So if you divide by one half on both sides, what happens to these halves over here? Brophy, they cancel each other out. Dark pen, here we go. They cancel each other out, and we're left with what on this side of the equation? Nick one. We're left with 10. So you chose the answer choice B? Who oh, else well, chose B? Okay, 20 divided by 1 half. Let's write that up. On the side. 20 divided by 1 half. What's the answer? How many times does one half go into 20? Aquan's smiling over there. Aquan, is it 10 times? Oh, it's not. Interesting. How many times does it go into 20? Flip that fraction. Do the multiplication. You know how to do that part. Uh, what do you say, Avisha? Who agrees with Avisha? Who changed their mind about their answer? Yeah, well, one five. Be proud. You just figured it out. Yeah, what is the answer? Everyone on two. B, C, ready to say the letter, ready? One, two, three. That is correct. 
how do we introduce yourself to the person next, sitting next to you? Would you just say hello to me? You should spend 30 seconds reflecting with them on what you saw in this video that might be a driver of some kind of results. Go. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Wow, that was great. You guys, I, I promise you wouldn't have to, but does anyone want to share an observation? What did you notice there that you thought was exceptional? A room full of great teachers. Who's going to be bold and great to share one thing? Yes, thank you, sir. What did you, uh, what, uh, what'd you notice? Um, it's a culture where failure was accepted. No, no, no. How do you know? What, what made you say this is a culture where uh, failure was something you learned from? Because um, she asked the student two years, two years to change their answer based on the number of students put their hands up, and they said they got it wrong. That's huge. How many, how many classrooms can you say, who got that wrong? Because we'll raise their hands. Okay. And then Katie socialized it even more. Put it high, be proud, you figured it out. Figuring it out is more important than getting it right in the first place. Right? That's the struggle. You get it wrong, you get it right, and that's, that's what we do in school. And so uh, thank you for your very insightful comment. One of the characteristics we see in great classrooms is they socialize students to be comfortable understanding that getting it wrong it's an important step in getting it right. There is no sustainable right without wrong. And so you have to be, it's what we call culture, you have to be willing to acknowledge and discuss when you get wrong. And if, if the goal of a teacher is to understand the difference between I taught it and you learned it, if kids are trying to hide their mistakes from you, it's 10 times harder than if they actually want you to see their mistakes so you can find them. It's so much, it's 10 times easier to find them. And so they're more successful. So, uh, this, very, this incredibly powerful cultural moment of uh, culture of error is one of the big drivers of the time across great classrooms. Any other observations that you thought were exceptional about the classroom? Yeah, what did you see? Yeah, uh, assessment and routine. Uh, so, so say, say uh, tell us what you mean by assessment and what you mean by routine. Okay, by assessment she was acutely aware of where her students were at, were at, but the reason why she was able to do that so well is she thought about the technique and it was a routine to those students, that move, that bang, bang. You know, yeah. it looks smooth because the kids have done it a million times, actually. Beautiful. So this idea of like there's a right way to do something, we have a routine, we practice it, and we do it. Uh, not only really makes it efficient, but it allows you to do things that you couldn't otherwise do. Imagine if you said, okay guys, let me see how you did on this problem. Show me on your hands what answer you got. If you got A, if you got B, if you got C, if you got D, okay, show me. Kids are like, okay, should I really do this? I'll look over here, okay, there's some twos. And then the really smart kids are like, oh, yeah, sorry, two, not one, two. I had two all along, right? So the whole, the ability to execute this beautiful academic mode of moment of assessment and uh, praising struggle starts with this very mundane system. And what we saw in classrooms like this over and over again, what we saw over and over again in classrooms like this was that uh, teachers had systems, routines, that they had taught their students in practice that undergirded what they did constantly. So the first video I'm teaching like a champion you're probably familiar with, it, it's, a, it's a video of a guy teaching his kids to pass out papers back and forth. Thank you, Bruno. It's a video of, uh, of a guy teaching his kids to pass out papers uh, because he can allow them to do it you know, two minutes faster than he could do if he hadn't practiced it and made the routine. Uh, and the net on that is, 10 days of instruction. And you, if, you save a, you know, if you save a minute every time you pass out papers, and you pass out papers 15 times a day over a 200 day school year, it's 15 days of instruction. And you can now, uh, because your kids understand how to do things like this routine, you can pull off incredible things. But there isn't a school of education in the country, in the US, that would stoop to teach its teachers how to teach their kids to install routines like this. So this whole system that you've rightly observed that's beneath this is beneath the threshold of narration in the teaching profession. Whether you, if you learn that, you, you're, it, it's, an, it's an accident. You're lucky. Maybe you have a mentor who teaches you. It's okay, I'm going to show one more video. Thank you for those great comments. Uh, this is actually um, a different school, but uh, you'll see this technique in the school we just showed. It's a, it's a great technique. This is Art World. This is North Star High School, which, by the way, um, KSA is one of the critical models that KSA used to found the school, as I understand it. I'm sure they made lots of great improvements, but uh, here's Art Morrell from North Star County. Possibly. Just gonna sing a little number all over this.
struggle with it, yeah. Uh, uh, so, sorry about that. I'll, uh, I'll try and post this on my blog, uh, teachlikeachampion.com backslash blog, and you can, uh, I'll try and show it to you there. Uh, but let's, in the interest of time, move on to uh, the video on the left. You might be back looking on Paul Powell. This actually is Troy Prep, the video that the school that we saw before. And I'm going to stop this a couple times in the area and talk about you know if it works. Hear that at all? All right, I can actually. Okay. We just. I can actually narrate this. Oh, it's not. It's not. We don't want to start anything yet. I'll just. I'll, I'll, I can actually. Uh, I'll do like an interpretive dance. I think I can narrate you. That's something I do uh, when I really like an audience. Okay. So here's Paul Powell. Uh, he's teaching math class. And we just pause it for a second. Um, how many people are familiar with cold call? So cold call is this incredible technique that teachers use. Uh, it's calling the students whether or not they raise their hands and offer to participate. And it's really important because uh, if I need to know what any student in my classroom knows, uh, and I rely on only the students who volunteer to tell me what they think they know, I'll always get a skewed sample of my classroom. I'll always get, the data will always tell me things are better than they are because the kids who raise their hand are more likely than other kids to have the answer right. And of course, I need to know what Marcus in the corner, uh, whether he's mastered it sometimes. And so great teachers normalize this process in the classroom of, okay, I'll just ask you, Marcus, what you think, and then you'll answer the question, and if you can't get it, you say, I can't get it, and then I come back to you. So cold calling is one of the sort of foundational skills of our school. But um, Paul and his teachers took that idea and they adapted it into something we call show call, which will be described in the new Teach Like a Champion book. Uh, and a show call is a cold call based on someone's student writing. So let's say I say, uh, scholars, take five minutes to describe how Jonas is changing in this chapter of the giver. Go. And they write for five minutes. But what do they write? Do they do high quality writing? Is it their best work? Do they feel accountable for doing work? Or are they just kind of writing lazy, sloppy sentences on their own while they're, while they're sitting at their desks? Well, what Paul and his teachers realized is at the end of that time, they could do a cold call. And instead of saying, Marcus, what did you write? They could say, Let's take a look at what Marcus wrote, and they could put Marcus's paper on the overhead projector. You can see he's got one up on his, uh, on his desk there. And, um, and then they could say, great, class, let's analyze what Marcus wrote. And then all of a sudden, students are accountable for the level of quality of their work when you assign them independent work to write. And all of a sudden, you can manage the written lives of students. So this is what Paul's doing here. This is, uh, this is Kalila in the front row, and he's actually about to take her paper. Do you mind just looking forward for a couple seconds? Whoa. Okay. So right now, uh, Kalila's pretty nervous, probably, right? Paul's taking her paper. He's going to project it to class. Uh, but he walks over here, and here's what he says right here. He says, the theme for today is showing your work, so I want to show off Kalila's paper. Take a look at what Kalila did here. You can see her, uh, she's got a problem, boom. And she's done this, boom. And she's done this, he's actually saying it, boom. <laughs> and if you can do this, he's about to turn to the class and say, if you can do this, you'll be incredibly successful at your math. So turn and correct your paper right now and make sure you've done everything that Kalila's done. And he says, but before you do that, there's one thing we need to fix about this work because we can always make it better. So who can tell Kalila the one small mistake that she made? So he, like Katie, builds this culture of constantly better, but he's now got this incredible tool for holding his kids accountable for the writing. And Natasha, we just roll it back up four seconds. He now asks the students, uh, three more seconds, if you don't mind, just pause it. Right, right here. He asks the students, who can tell me what Kalila could improve on her paper? And whose hand is up the straightest in the middle? <laughs> so it's incredibly, uh, it's an incredibly positive and powerful tool. So this is especially uh, exciting to me. Natasha, would you mind just taking me back to the slide? Great. 
Great. Uh, it's incredibly exciting because what it suggests is that when you give great teachers tools, they're constantly adapting them and improving them and changing them. And that's really what happened to Teach Like a Champion and why I had to rewrite the book, which I'm happy to say will be out in December. And uh, it's full of great new insight from teachers. 62 techniques this time around instead of 49. I dropped some. Some like check for understanding got turned into chapters. So um, you never stop writing great teachers. Uh, and so it just reminds me of the power of bright spots. When someone does something right and solves a problem, it's an incredible opportunity to learn and study. And what we do right is at least as important as what we do wrong. It also reminds me that um, we talk about the achievement gap, but there are really achievement gaps. There's the gap between rich and poor academic performance. There's the gap between this country and uh, the top performing countries in education. There's the gap between our kids and what they deserve and what we're able to give them. We can always give them more. And for every one of those gaps, there is some teacher somewhere who has crossed that gap. There is some teacher for whom there is no uh, four kids with X challenges perform as well as the kids of uh, the most successful kids. So the problem is not that we don't as educators know the solutions. The problem is that we haven't found the teachers and we haven't studied them. She is somewhere right now in Sheffield lesson planning for the incredible lesson tomorrow that has the solutions to, the achieve, to all of our achievement gaps. We just don't know who she is and what she does. And so uh, when we study teachers, we spend a lot of time in the US putting teachers in buckets, which is we evaluate them on the test score and their principal evaluations, and we say, OK, there are top performing teachers, and there's a second tier of teachers, and there are the third tier of teachers, and there are the lowest performing teachers. And who do you think we worry about the most? The lowest performing teachers, what will happen to them if we evaluate them? Will we have to fire them? How will we have, how will we have those conversations? Are those conversations fair? Those discussions are important, they matter. But much more important than what happens to the bottom quartiles, what happens to the top quartile of our profession, because they are the people who can build the knowledge of the profession. <laughs> so we define teachers in all kinds of hilarious ways, and we hire Arnold Schwarzenegger to play us at our best, or Jack Black. <laughs> Jack Black, what's right? But the piece that's not really in the picture is, is teachers as um, as intellectuals, as the people who develop the knowledge of our field. As teachers, we get told all the time, someone who's not actually looking. Someone who's not actually a teacher comes up with a theory. Your classroom should be democratic. And then they tell us how to do that. Here's how to make your classroom democratic. The teachers don't actually get to build the knowledge of the profession, to contribute to the knowledge of the profession. And if we're able to do that, then we make teaching a different job that's not just about executing someone else's ideas, but about, uh, about knowledge development, which is the most important work we make. And so to me, this opportunity of identifying and studying great teachers and replicating gives us the opportunity also to change the profession. What do you do when you're a really successful teacher and you've been a really successful teacher for 15 years? Well, you could become an administrator and do a totally different job than you love. Or maybe you could be, maybe, you know, maybe this is the opportunity to, to create jobs that give career path to teachers within the, that still involve teaching and being in the classroom. The other thing about data that's really interesting is that anyone can run the numbers. I'm sure there are people in this room who disagree with all my findings from my studies of, of high performing teachers. Uh, fine. Uh, the only thing I know for sure about my book is that it must be wrong. Something must be wrong. I was in a great classroom. Katie Bulici did something incredible. Uh, and I was looking out the window when she did the thing that really drove results. And then I turned around and I was like, oh, this is the only thing I know for sure is that I'm wrong. So for people who are skeptical of the like champion, I would just say, you can recreate this by uh, and find your own solutions to teaching problems by deciding what the metro block is. Great essays. Measuring the work that teachers do, and then finding the best of them in study. And any school system anywhere can do that. And it will allow us to put ourselves in our first obligation, which is to make our teachers better. The people who commit their lives to doing this are not well paid as it might be challenging, difficult, long, grueling hours, uh, no fancy little coffee spot in the middle of the office where you can go and have a, a, a cup of tea and maybe a nice bag of crisps anytime you want to. We don't get that from teachers, I'm sorry. But we should at least work for organizations that make us better constantly. Um, and that's especially important because uh, all we do 
is fight over the great teachers that are out there, and decide which school that we, which school they go to, our victories will be pure. By which I mean, if there's a great teacher and I can recruit her to come to my school and she can teach my 30 kids versus the 30 kids in the school that where she was already, nobody really wins. It's just it's 30 different kids who get her teaching. What I have to do to win is to find a way to help other teachers understand what she does and replicate it so it can be 300 or 3,000 or 30,000 kids who benefit from that teacher's insight. So the core of our work is human capital, which is a fancy term uh, for my, Sir Michael Barber's observation that the quality of the school system can never exceed the quality of its teachers. And either you get that as a school or you fail. This is the biggest thing that people misunderstand about charter schools. They think that we're uh, out to like churn people out and spit them, uh, churn people up and spit them out and take advantage of them. And the, the best charter schools in the U.S. realized very quickly that we were only going to succeed if we honored our teachers and learned from them and made them love teaching there and got the best out of them. Uh, so charter doesn't matter. Effective schools use every tool they can to honor, develop, and understand and study their teachers. Their freedom to do that. That's the, that's the flexibility that matters for us. So um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share this with you, uh, despite my video challenges. Uh, if you like watching video of great teachers, especially video that works with great teachers, I just want to uh, let you know that uh, October 9th to 10th, here in London, uh, we're doing our first workshop ever out in the US. We spent two days studying the techniques of great teachers uh, based on video and practicing them. Uh, it's going to be high academic expectations, so uh, we'll be uh, an engaging academics. So I hope you'll be able to really like the idea of geeking out of teachers. Please come join us because I love sharing your insight and wisdom. So um, you, are, you may have questions, and if you do, I am ready. <laughs> Doug, thank you very much indeed. We've got about 20 minutes left of questions now. Um, I'm going to make my usual plea, which is always ignored, but I'm going to make it anyway. Um, if you have a question, can you make it a short, brief question, rather than a statement, or rather than a speech that says, I'm really disappointed that you didn't mention this tiny or steel thing that I'm fascinated by. Um, but if you could ask a very specific question um, that is at least vaguely related to the lecture and that Doug can answer, that would be hugely appreciated. Um, and if, I don't know if you've got any other mics, but you may just have to kind of stand up and shout loudly. Uh, so, let's see, who would like to ask a question? Please, the woman at the back there. Um, I'm quite interested in how you can replicate some of these things if you are a teacher who is having a lot of challenging thing, the first thing we do is we put a name on it. So the very least I can just get, oh, we call it teaching on an right? It's great, the ideal situation is you're in a school like KSA where we all decide that we want to handle it, we want to do things in a systematic way and support each other. It's much harder when you're, when you're on your own and triply so when you only see the kids once in a while. Uh, my gut is I would choose a couple of core things that I got and that I would want to install really well. Uh, and you know, our advice to teachers when they start trying to use, for, for us it starts with discipline, which is, and our definition of discipline is teaching kids the right way to do something, or, uh, or actually teaching anyone the right way to do something. Uh, husbands in particular, uh, sometimes <laughs> fun, discipline. Sometimes unsuccessful, I'm sorry, I'm doing my best over here. Uh, so, uh, so the first thing I would want to do is I would want to choose a couple of core things and, and, uh, and teach the kids the right way to do so when you come into my classroom, here's the way you come into my classroom. I uh, expect you to sit down and quietly get to work, and here's the reason for it. Let's practice that now. <coughs> that was very good. That was great. I love the way you came into the classroom. I think that we can do it even a little bit better. Go show me again. Uh, what we find is that when you make that upfront investment in the right way to do it, first of all, kids like it because they, they, they like knowing what to do. Uh, and they practice it so they muscle memory of it. Um, and then you can refer back to it constantly. So I think I would choose a few things, and generally speaking, when you feel like you're spending a little bit too much time on those routines, you're probably just about right. So I think I'd at least want to build a culture with my kids of, uh, I'm, I'm Mr. Lamob, things are a little bit different here. Because they'll start talking about it and say, oh yeah, she's, she's, got, she's got a way of doing things, she's not like other teachers. 
And once they kind of acknowledge that, and they actually see that they kind of like it, they like the predictability of it. They like the, you know, the fact that if they do this thing, they get more class is actually pretty interesting. Uh, then I think they'll be with you and you'll be able to do more things more efficiently. So I choose two or three things and get them installed really well and hopefully get the kids with you. It's a really tough question and a good one. Great, thanks so much. Um, so I gave a long day again, sorry. Let's get the gentleman there. Fascinating watching the techniques and, um, and you know, the technologies and I think that they're brilliant. I agree with a lot of them. It feels bad watching because you know, we reinvented the wheel in a lot of ways and came a lot of us in this room doing those techniques and discovering them for ourselves. But when you observe those in top right um, institutions, then, did you see um, outstanding teacher training models, schools which had systems which were producing outstanding teachers? And if so, what, what were they like? Great question. At first, no. At first, we were really finding few teachers, but then as time has evolved, now there are schools that reliably get, like, reliably produce up right hand for the results. I think there are um, two characteristics of their, of their training. One is it's, a, it's deeply embedded in the fabric of the school. That you can't do what I would call drive-by training, which is you say, oh, Doug them up, he wrote a fancy book about teaching, so let's have him come out to the school and talk to us for three hours about fancy teaching, and then every, you know, then all the teachers will be able to do it. Right, for training to work, it has to be embedded in the fabric of school, so uh, teachers have to then talk about it and be able to schedule meetings when they come back and say, how's it going? I'm struggling with this. This is going really well. And the person who supervises them has to say, ah, I see, we're cold calling. That was really good, but you could cold call a little bit better if you did this. And then if it doesn't live in the fabric of the school, it, it doesn't work. And so I think schools are really good about, you know, they lead their own training. The best schools are really smart, because if I said, could I come to a workshop for you? They would say, hmm, no thanks. I think this is better if I do it myself, right? Which I, I love that about them. And the second thing is that they practice like crazy. The, the second book that I wrote, which apparently no one has ever heard of, is called Practice Perfect. Uh, and actually, I, think, I actually think it's the more useful, it's the more powerful book in some ways, because what we realized is that there's a gap between get it and do it. That I can show you a video of RFRL cold calling, and you can say, wow, that's great, I should cold call. And at first we thought when we showed videos like that that we were like 80 or 90% of the way to making teachers able to cold call. But what it turned out is people would come to the workshop and they'd say, that's so brilliant, I've learned so much from these great teachers. And they would go back to their classrooms and we would check in with them six months later and they would say, actually, I um, can't do it. And that what we had to do in our training is to make people better to have them practice. Practice, 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 practice. And actually say, okay, now let's practice cold calling right now. It's awkward. You're going to have to pretend that I am your year four students right now. But you and I are going to practice cold calling. And that when you do that, you get over to get it to a gap. And that, to me, is the big driver. And that's what we see in the best programs. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, we'll move right to back. And then the gentleman then take them So, yeah. It's such a good question, I'm glad you asked it. So, I personally love teachers and respect and admire them above all people, and so my goal is to show them things that could be useful to them and never to mandate that they must use it. So, uh, my approach would be to say, here's some things we've learned from studying, from studying people like you <coughs> that are useful in situations like yours, and now you go decide what you want to do with it. And oftentimes, like, their principal may have a different, their principal may walk into their classroom and say, you know, sweetheart, you've got a cold call. <laughs> but I think that, to me, that's a supervisor relationship. Uh, when, from a training perspective, I really think it's important to trust teachers. I don't like it when teachers get told what to do. I like it when teachers get told an outcome they have to deliver, outstanding achievement in math, and then they're trusted to figure out the best way to get there. So uh, I think your question is it's really important to say here things that can be good. I think of this as a toolbox as opposed to a system, right? And if you can you adapt it in the way that works. And if you can get incredible results without cold calling, the last thing I want to do is make you change your incredible results. Uh, and if you adapt it to make it more powerful, or more like you, or more in your own style, uh, all the better. Uh, so just because it's sort of very, uh, uh, because it, it's very specific and, ex and explained methodically, to me, is, 
It's not formula. It's a toolbox. Thanks. Uh, I, I, I love your techniques and I, I, the systemization especially has, has revolutionized my teaching. But I teach in primary school and the, the critic, um, criticisms I sometimes hear from colleagues in primary is that it's turning children, especially younger children, into, into robots. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you think that there's a, a difference between the appropriateness of some of the techniques in the book between primary and, and secondary. Yeah, it's a great question. Maybe I can just divide it into two questions, which is, do I think I'm, we're turning kids into robots? Uh, and then, how do you adapt it for, uh, for older students? Um, I just think it's important to note that uh, because you can do things does not mean that you must. So because I can get my kids to line up and be quiet when I ask them to be quiet does not mean that I always must. And in fact, I think the great irony of these techniques is that if I want to take my kids and say, okay, now go off to the corners of the room, and based on everything we've discussed, decide which of the causes of the American Civil War you think is most important, and write me a sentence that describes its importance in pairs. Go. I can really only do that if I can just if I can then say, okay, guys, great work. Bring it back in five. You know, like, uh, I want you to come back and be sure you guys ready to discuss that in five seconds. And if it takes me five minutes to get them back, and it's crazy and it's disorderly, then I can't really give them that freedom. So to me, the sort of Structure and the freedom to go together. And the, I think, I definitely know teachers who get control of their classroom and you feel like now I have control, the pain is gone, and so I want to have it always be orderly. But being able to make it structured and orderly doesn't mean it is in every minute. So you can, you know, it allows you to let kids have autonomy in a straight way. I also think the techniques need to be adapted for older students. I think uh, we're learning more and more about that. But I'm happy to say there are a lot more. High school videos in the usual, but I think that I think about half the techniques are just different for older students. You talk to them differently, you make adaptations for it. I'm always excited when, when teachers in different settings find ways to adapt the techniques, but I'm also struck by how often the high school teacher will say, "Actually, it's pretty much the same." Uh, that you know, people will say you can't, but you often can. So I think it's probably 50-50 between yes, yeah, got kind of different, and surely there are some techniques that don't apply to high school students. But a lot of times I think people are, it's very risky to try something with older students. It feels more like you're trying it in front of adults. They can be very dismissive of you if it crashes. And so I think it's easy to say, hey, in the face of that risk, instead of taking the risk of trying it in front of a room full of 17 year olds, to say it really can't be done, or maybe even it shouldn't be done with 17 year olds, because that's easier than the scary task of saying, like, oh, I'm gonna roll the dice and see if I can, if I can pull it off. Can I use Chair Robertson and ask you a question, which is, sure. can you talk a little bit about how the leadership are on common work, so the kind of the principles and the middle leadership, and if there are different ways in which that leadership operates, what leaders look for, how leaders and other common trying to teach us? Yeah, I think one of the simplest things that we do that's really powerful is kind of mundane and obvious, which is we divide leadership in half in our schools. So there's uh, an instructional leader, the principal, and there's a director of operations. When I was the principal of the school, I spent about half my time on heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. We were, you know, we were doing the school, and then another big chunk of my time on, on vinyl, vinyl composition tile. And I'll just be down over here later if anyone wants to chat about vinyl composition tile. It's fascinating. Um, and of course, I was doing those things instead of being the instructional leader of the school. And so I think we figured out that, or uh, smarter people than I in the organization realized that you really have to have someone who does the, uh, the personnel and the lunches and vinyl composition tile and the compliance and all the operational stuff that was running the organization so that the principal can just be the instructional leader of the school and spend 80% of her time observing teachers, giving feedback to teachers, uh, designing the curriculum, overseeing lesson plans and that kind of thing. So that divide just by itself allows you know, people to multiply mm -hmm. the time that they can spend. But um, I think it's just important that we uh, it's important for us to have sort of second and third tier leadership roles and that great teachers get the opportunity to lead within the school as well. What I sometimes think, well, you know, who is the, what is the, what is the description of the principal who can make a great school like, say, KSA? And, uh, and with all due respect to, uh, to Max, there is no one person who can make a school like KSA. It has to be a team effort. And uh, other people have to participate in the leadership of the school and feel like the school is theirs as well. So we really try to have all of our schools have a leadership team that meets weekly. It's the principal, it's the heads of, you know, it's four heads, and they get together. Uh, and what their job is to do is to problem solve, uh, 
broad challenges across the school. So I think that sense of distributive leadership is, is pretty alive in our schools. I think you can see that if you came to visit, which I hope you will. Great. So okay, let's have a couple more questions from the audience. Uh, yes, the woman there, and then we'll the back there. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious to know what you think, this is going to be nice and close, but what you think it will take is system change. So what you've heard described is, um, you know, kind of on the ground, you know, clean up teachers, identifying great practice and really studying what those teachers are doing, sharing that knowledge. Do you believe that fundamentally that is what is going to create system change, or do you see that something much more fundamental needs to happen? Such a good question. Uh, <laughs> excuse my, my probably lack of a great answer by saying I really think of myself as a teaching guy and not a systems guy. Uh, uh, but I do think that um, one of the hidden powers, the most successful charge tools, I think, are the hidden causes of our success is what I would call teacher choice. Everyone focuses on student choice, how powerful it is your families doing to choose the right school for them. But if you don't have teacher choice, it's very hard to run a great organization and therefore a system of great organizations. In other words, if I'm the principal of the school and I say, this is the way that I want to approach instruction, this is the way that I want to approach math, this is what I want, this is our, this is our philosophy of it, and I can ask my teachers to do that and they can fold their arms and say, no, I, don't, I, I, don't, I just don't want to do it that way. I don't want to teach math like the rest of my colleagues and I don't want to have the same behavioral expectations or cultural expectations that, that you do. And all that stuff you do with the rah-rah and the super, super cool math, I'm not interested in that. I'm going to fold my arms and, and, uh, and you can just try to fire me. Uh, as long as we have a profession that enshrines and, and honors that, uh, that desire to not, do with the, to not let an organization have a philosophy and, uh, and an approach, I think it's very hard to run a great organization without that. That to me is what is what charter schools have to really talk about. Teacher choice, because I can say, this is how we do it in our schools. And you can walk through and you can see it. And if you think that, that you know is wrong and that you know, it makes kids robots or whatever people think about, you know, for perfectly legitimate reasons, God bless you, you can go teach in another school. Because this is how we do it here. And if you join us, this is how we're gonna ask you to do it. And that, to me, is very powerful because it lets the organization implement things through and through and execute thoroughly uh, and have a philosophy that you can test. And so I can tell whether my school, my school model is working in ways that others can. So to me, um, bring up organizations to manage their people and let teachers choose according to more than just, well, I want to sit in this room in the school is, is probably a really critical piece of it that we've been slow to recognize in the United States. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, my assumption is always that there are lots of things that we're not measuring when we, when we measure test scores. One of the primary ways we do that is to talk to principals uh, and ask them, when we find a high-performing principal, we ask them their opinion about which teachers and why in their schools. And I think that's interesting because the aggregate data on principals is that most principals are not very good judges of, of good teachers if you, believe what, if you believe what experts say about this. But that, to me, is that there's a danger in averages and that excellent principles actually the data suggests are actually pretty good judges of great teachers and in fact you could argue the reason they're good principles is because they're good judges of, of effective teaching and so it's really important to us to take the data at least and double check it by saying what do you, you know, does this make sense because you know, there have to be teachers who they have an anomalously great year and they're actually not that great a teacher or they're great because they, the person who had the kids the year before them did great work and the principal might say you know maybe yes and maybe no but you really don't know and so we always try and um, balance our look, our, when we look at data with, uh, when, we have, when we have reason to really believe in the principle there with a sort of narrative description of teachers. But that also doesn't mean we don't have real blind spots in what we're looking for. And I would just, I would just acknowledge that it's imperfect at best. Okay, I'm afraid that's all time we've got questions for. Can I just ask uh, everyone now, just before we uh, uh, have a vote of thanks, can I just everyone to uh, thank Doug again for his time tonight?
Um, we got a bit of name checking this evening from a few people. So I didn't pay them, honestly, but I did let them use the school. And it's been an honour and a privilege to welcome all of you here tonight. Uh, this, you know, when a bunch of people who are connected with Policy Exchange, and in particular Teach First, turn up at our school, it's like, you know, an extended family arriving. And it's great to see so many familiar faces and people who have supported and kind of cheered the school on over the years. I think um, I could thank Doug in a big way for the lecture and for all of his insights. But it's also a nice opportunity to thank him and his coll colleagues in Uncommon Schools. Because as he mentioned, I had the huge privilege many years ago, before I started King Solomon Academy Secondary, to go and hang out in some of the classrooms that Doug's been hanging out in, in our all's classroom. And just, you know, kind of mind-blowing uh, high expectations and excellence in not just one classroom, not just one school, but in a whole system of schools. And I think I, you know, started the journey here with a blueprint of what's possible. And I think that the really exciting thing about that graph, where there's a top right-hand corner, when KSA started, even, you know, quite recently, that those top right-hand corner points were quite hard to find. And I think the really exciting thing is that it's not just KSA who's putting a dot up there. There are multiple data points going up there. And I think, just like Doug's identified them, I think kind of our education system can identify them too. And um, so that's, it's a really exciting moment. And we're really pleased that Doug's here to inspire us. But hopefully we can inspire each other as well. But thank you very much, Doug, for the lecture. Thank you, and just one final thing I want to say to, to wrap it up is, I think one of the things that Brett said, which is that everyone in this room is sort of united by this shared belief in what we're trying to achieve. I think one of the things that I'm so delighted as to why we have done tonight is that it brings together the sort of nexus of, of policy exchange and Teach First, and our planning schools in Teach First, who are all working with people like Doug and taking the idea of education reformers in the US, in England, in countries across the world, to try and do what we can to try and address the issue that Doug so rightly put out. I thought it was a fantastic lecture. I thought it really kind of hit the nail on the head. It talked to a lot of the things I think people in this room have been thinking. Um, there were some fantastic quotes. Uh, really, really powerful stuff. Doug, I'm so profoundly grateful that you gave the Policy Exchange lecture. And as a token of our esteem, uh, I'd just like to present you with a very small gift. Ladies and gentlemen, Doug was wonderful.